Hi, my name is Mike. I'm one of the pastors here at Kings Harbor. And thank you so much for utilizing this resource. Our hope for you and anything that we provide is that you would expect transformation, that we could demonstrate love towards you because of the love of God demonstrated to us, that you would have the faith stirred in you to deal with obstacles and to see opportunities, and that ultimately that the kingdom of God would be revealed in every area of your life. And so our hope with this resource is that the Lord would speak to you powerfully. If you got a Bible, go to Matthew chapter 13. Uh, that's where we're going to be again this morning as we continue to walk through our series, Kingdom and Priest. Uh, just as a way of reminder, um, this week is actually a unique turn in, in the series uh, because thus far we've been really trying to answer the question, what is the kingdom? As Jesus, Jesus has been walking through these parables, he's making these analogies, the kingdom is like, or, or the kingdom has this type of manner to it. But then... We're going to see, starting next week, some really clear uh, explanations of Jesus. But because the kingdom is this way, this is how you should live. And, and this week feels like this is where the Venn diagram overlaps. Because Jesus will give an analogy of what the kingdom is, but he also talks about the way that people respond to the revelation of the kingdom. And I think both are really crucial for us. And so our main idea this morning is simply this. Jesus tells us that the kingdom of heaven has an inestimable value. Our only reasonable response is glad submission. So here's what I want to do this morning. I want to, I want to take a moment. I just want to review so far what we know that the kingdom is. And then we're going to look at two short parables, the parable of the hidden treasure and the parable of the priceless pearl. And so let me pray, and then we'll jump right in. And so Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity that because of your word and your spirit, that, th that we're being formed more into your image, that you are molding us, that you are um, gently compelling us towards what it is to know and be like you. So will you do that today as we um, peer into the, the depths of the word that you've given us? So in your matchless name we pray. Amen. So we've been walking through particularly Matthew 13, but actually the first week of the series, we started in Matthew chapter four, but I thought this would be just a good moment to say, okay, what do we know so far about the kingdom? And so here's a, a few bullet points. And, and if you're a Kings Harbor app user, this, there, there's fill in notes that you can utilize for this. Um, these will also be on the screen for you or as a lower third for you if you're watching on the stream. And here's what it would say. Um, the kingdom of heaven is, and one of the things that we'd say is that it's present in the ministry, message, and miracles of Jesus. And we saw this in Matthew chapter four, that as Matthew was writing and trying to introduce this idea of the kingdom has come near, that he, he talks about both the message of Jesus and the miracles of Jesus and what Jesus is doing and how this is the embodiment of God's kingdom, his message of redemption, this moment of those that were in darkness and brokenness, seeing the light and the kindness of God it being made available to them. And the point was that the kingdom is not some distant uh, esoteric reality that someday we hope shows up, nor is it some geographical place that we can't get to, but the kingdom is present and it came near in the work and the embodiment of Jesus. Here's the second one. It's not just that the kingdom is present, but the kingdom is available and able to produce fruit in the lives of those who receive it. This was the parable of the sower and the different soils. And, and the, the, the heart of the parable was that there, the kingdom is available, that the seed is being thrown out, but there are some that do not receive it. And so therefore, the fruit of the kingdom in their life is not being produced or being made evident in them. Here's the third thing that we know, that the kingdom is at work, even with the continued presence of evil in the world. And we can feel that tension when it's like, man, is the kingdom of God here? Because it looks like there's a lot in this world that needs to change. That if you spent any time awake in the last 24 hours, you've probably thought the kingdom of God needs to do some work in this place, this place, this place. And, and maybe you're sitting next to somebody in that place, a whole bunch of work. 
And so Jesus, through the parable of the wheat and the weeds and through the parable of the net, um, begins to explain to his disciples as they, it feels like they're dealing with this tension and this confusion. Like, like, why is the world the way that it is? Why are you even teaching this way because of the way that you're being rejected? Like, why hasn't everything been made right if the kingdom has shown up and is real? And he's like, it's at work and it will accomplish its work. But there's a level of patience in the kingdom that maybe you're not ready for. And then he, last week we spent a lot of time talking about that the kingdom is dynamic and pervasive. That though it seems small and hard to perceive, it continues to transform the world. And and, and I I wish, um, there are times in preaching where you preach a message and you're like, I can't never preach that again. Like I got everything out of that that I could get out of that. And there's other times where you preach a message and you're like, I may just preach it again next week. Hopefully nobody remembered that I preached it the previous week. And I feel that way because I wish that I could embed even more deeply at our souls the beauty of when you look at what the kingdom of God has accomplished, that though it may seem small and imperceptible, that it's doing work that maybe we just haven't slowed down and taken recognition of. And so this week, as we jump into these two parables It feels like Jesus is beginning to lead them down a path that that you're seeing in me that the kingdom of God, the rule and reign of God, the saving message, the redeeming message of God is being made available, that it's present, not just in the future, but right now, and not just right now, but to those who would receive it, it's available, it's at work, and it's growing and changing the world around it. It seems like he's leading them to a conclusion that if all of this is true about the kingdom, how should you feel about it? And so Matthew chapter 13, starting in verse 44, would simply say this. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure buried in a field that a man found and reburied. Then in his joy, he goes and sells everything he has and buys that field. Now, I think it's important because the last two parables that we just walked through, yet last week, and this parable and the one that's coming next, um, the writers that are smarter than me won't call them parables, they'll call them similitudes. Now, I don't know what the word similitude means either, so like, don't feel like, you, like you're disqualified if you know what it means, but what it does pertain to or refer to is a simile. Now, here's what a simile is. It is, it is this uh, comparison of things that are not alike to cry, try and create this vivid example that you, that you can understand. And so if you, you actually operate in similes all the time. And so if somebody makes you a, a cookie and you taste the cookie, you're like, this tastes like magic. As far as I know, they didn't like a little bit of flour, a little bit of pixie dust, a little bit of sugar. Like, I don't think there's magic in that cookie. But you're using that language to, to make this vivid picture or this vivid understanding. Or if you... Maybe the, if you have small children, toddlers, and they destroy stuff in your house, um, maybe you say, that kid's like a bull in a china closet. Well, unless you are somehow part of the bovine family, your child is not a cow. It's not a bull. It's this vivid description to try and describe what's happening. And so Jesus seems to be doing that, saying the kingdom is like, the kingdom is not actually a seed that grows into a tree. The kingdom is not actually leaven that is in bread. The kingdom is not actually treasure that's found in a field. But this, the emotions that come from thinking about treasure found in a field is what he's get, trying to tap into. And then the idea that the way that he would describe the kingdom is what would be desired by so many people. Uh, This is going to date me, and that's okay. It's going to date some of you too, because some of you are going to be like, oh, and some of you are going to be like, what? So back when I was a kid, there was this thing called Publisher's Clearinghouse. And Publishers Clearinghouse, like you, like it was like this subscription where I think you bought like magazines and like TV Guide, and so kids in the room, a t- TV Guide used to be this little thing that they would put out where so you would like flip through it every week to find what time the shows that you always watch at the same time, figure out what time they were going to come on that week, the same time as last week. And so you like get things like TV Guide and Reader's Digest and all these things, and with the hopes of. If you have the right, the right selection, that you were going to get lots of money. And this guy named Ed McMahon <laughs> was supposed to show up at your house with this unreasonably large check. 
that had an amount of money on it. And like, I think back now and I'm like, I'm just trying to remember those checks in my mind. And I'm like, I don't, I don't actually think there was that many zeros on that check. Like maybe it was $250,000. Like I actually have no idea, but I looked it up this week. It actually still exists and they're giving away $15 million just in case. And so the idea was, man, if I am the person selected, my life's going to be completely different. The amount of times our family renewed our subscription to TV Guide, <laughs> hoping that it would change our destinies. Or, or, or maybe this. Um, I, I can remember that McDonald's used to do, use the, do the Monopoly sweepstakes. And you would like go and like buy fries and buy a drink and like you'd pull off the sticker and it was supposed to get you a piece of Monopoly board. And you were okay if you got a free small fry because they gave those jokers away like they were running out of style. But what you were in it for was the million dollars. You were hoping you'd pull that sticker to be like, oh, a million dollars. My life is completely different. Like this desire for more and for treasure and for wealth. Like Jesus would make this analogy. He would make this simile and say, hey, the kingdom is like the person who finds that type of treasure. It's, it's like the, the, pro, the situation where this person is working in a field, digging one day, runs up on a treasure, pulls it out of the ground, says, this is unbelievable, puts it back, buries it again, and goes sells everything else that he has so that he can buy that field. But here's some things that the, that the parable is not. It is not a description of the salvation process. It is not a description that if you work hard enough and do enough and find it and then go sell everything you have so that way you can purchase and earn and merit your way into the kingdom that you get into the kingdom, that that's not the point of what Jesus is trying to say. Jesus is not trying to convince them, hey, do more that way you might have access because what he's already said is that the kingdom is like a seed that's being thrown out and it grows and it draws to it those that need it, not those find a way to cultivate it for themselves. So the point he's not getting at is follow this process and you will then be saved. I think the other thing that's interesting is the context. That it's most likely because the guy had to go purchase the field that he didn't own the field. And so this seems to be a hired worker who's operating in somebody else's field doing his mundane, whatever the work hours would have been of the day job that he's just in a mundane, mundane way going about his life. It doesn't feel like he was running around looking for treasure and seemed to happen to find treasure. It, it seems like he was not in, intentional about finding treasure at all. And somehow in the middle of his life that this treasure gets revealed to him and when he recognizes what he's found, he doesn't take it for granted. He goes and sells everything that he might get it. I think it's interesting because as I was studying this week, people that were smarter than me began to debate about how should we feel morally about what this guy has done? Because if it's not his field, it's technically not his treasure. And they're like, well, is it, is it some kind of corruption or deception that he found this treasure, buried it back, goes and buys the field from the owner of the field and doesn't tell him, hey, by the way, you've got this immeasurable treasure in your field. Sometimes smart people are real, real dumb. Because Jesus is not trying to build, in case you find a treasure, here are the steps. First of all, call the police and say, has anybody lost a treasure? What he's trying to get to is the man's reaction to something that he found. And what it feels like those that are arguing this missed is the guy sold everything that he had to go purchase the field. So this guy is not running a side deal where he's like, hmm, you know what, I could give you full price for the field, but you know what, I'm not going to tell you about what's actually there. I'm going to just give you a little bit. This isn't Ananias and Sapphira from the book of Acts who have more to give, but they're not giving that thing. That this man sells and gives everything because he understands the value of what he's found. And it literally says that after going and selling all of his stuff to get this treasure, that it says that because of the joy that he felt that he was willing to do that. Think about what Jesus is saying, that this guy in an unexpected place experiences this uh, valuable treasure, more than he could measure, so much so that he's willing to forsake everything else that he might have this. Think about what that would say to us. 
that if the kingdom of God is like this scenario, that we who have found the kingdom, that our response ought to be that when God gives us the beauty of his rule and reign being revealed in the world around us in the midst of our mundane lives, that this is something that ought to stir joy in us and cause us to be willing to give all away for that thing. I wrote it this way. The kingdom shows up in unexpected places, transforming duty into delight. And, and I just wanna, I wanna speak uh, to, to a couple of audiences in the room. I wanna start with believers in Jesus Christ. Like I don't, I don't know that how Jesus was intending to tell, tell this parable, if he meant to tell it as this one time cause and effect, or if he meant to say that the experience of the kingdom being revealed around you takes your boring everyday life and squeezes joy out of it that you could not imagine. But I'm just gonna take creative liberty with Jesus' story, and I just wanna point out that the kingdom is continually revealed over and over, that if the kingdom is dynamic and pervasive, then over and over again, the kingdom is showing its power, showing its effect, showing its ramifications, and that's meant to continue to stir us towards more and more joy. Uh, there's a pastor in Chicago. Um, his name is Charlie Dates. I've mentioned him to you before. And Charlie Dates is, uh, so I, well, let me say it this way. I'm a basketball player, but no matter, I was a basketball player, <laughs> But no matter how good I was when I played, like I never secretly thought in my mind, you know what? If, if LeBron James walked into this Lifetime Fitness right now, we, we're the same level. <laughs> we're, just, we're just not. Like he's six foot nine, 275 pounds, runs faster than me, jumps higher than I do, and is actually good at basketball. And so when I say that, I say there are also preachers that way. And Charlie Dates is like that. Like Charlie's just a different level than me. Like, don't, like, stop coming to Kings Harbor to, like, watch Charlie online. Don't do that. But he's a better preacher than me. <laughs> and Charlie made this statement, and it resonated with me. He said, here's what I constantly pray for my church, that we never get so used to God, what God's doing that we become quiet church. That we never get so used to what the kingdom is doing that it just becomes mundane and boring and run of the mill for us, but that God would continue to refresh in us over and over again this joy, this sense of, I can't believe that God did that. And so I read what Jesus says in this parable that the kingdom is like walking into a field and discovering that this great treasure has been revealed to you and that you would give everything up out of joy to get to that treasure. And I just long for us to be that type of people that when we see God moving. And so when you're in small group and the person that was struggling with sin gets free from sin, that we don't just kind of golf clap, but there's joy that stirs in us. That when we hear stories of people's lives being changed, when they step in baptismal waters, that we just don't say, oh, well, it's celebration weekend. Somebody had to get in the pool. But that we recognize that the kingdom's being revealed, and then it stirs something in us. When there's this invitation for people who haven't heard of the gospel to hear the gospel, that we just say, man, it's, it's cool that the church does that. But that the kingdom is being revealed, and it would stir something in us. Yes. That when the kingdom is revealed in unexpected places, that it would take the mundane nature of day-to-day -day life and it would stir delight in those that see it. And let me say, if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, here's my prayer, that in the unexpected places that you wouldn't imagine, that the kingdom of God would show up like a treasure that you could not put value on and that you would respond by saying, this is worth everything. In fact, I think the, the, the second parable speaks to that maybe even more uh, directly than the first one does. Matthew 13, 45 would say it this way. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. When he found one priceless pearl, he went and sold everything he had and bought it. Now, there's a couple of things I, I want to point out. The, the stories are similar, but there's some key differences. 
Here's one of the things. I mentioned it earlier that it doesn't seem like the worker in the field was actually looking for the treasure that he found. He just happened to stumble upon it. But this feels like this merchant is intentionally searching, yearning, longing, trying to find the best possible pearl that he could find. Here's the second thing. The worker had nothing to compare his treasure against. It was a treasure all by itself in a field, but this m- m- pearl merchant was running around looking at different pearls at different prices and, and, and had to answer the question eventually, what am I going to buy? What am I going to put my money and energy behind? And he chooses this one particular pearl. Now, maybe this feels a little lost on us because um, unless you're of a certain demographic, pearls don't mean anything to you. But I, I, would, I would say this, that in that day and age that many people commonly thought that pearls were the most valuable object in the world. And in the Roman culture, there are two uh, important stories. And one of those is that Cleopatra was said to have two pearls that the, the way that they, they were estimated in their size and their value were worth like 10 million sectorines, I think was the, the name of the, of the, the denomination of money. There's another story that Julius Caesar gave Brutus's mother a pearl that was worth six million sectorines or whatever the name of that type of denomination of money is. Here's what you need to know about that. If you were going to be part of the elite class of, of Romans culture, the senatorial class, you would need at least one million of that level of money for you to be considered elite. And she had pearls that were worth 10 times that. Julius Caesar gave away a pearl that was worth six times that. So six families, if they divided up the the value of this pearl, that all of a sudden they would be considered wealthy and elite. And so pearls meant something in that culture that probably doesn't weigh on us in the same way. And this merchant is searching for pearls and he finds this pearl of great price and the search is over. He stops looking other places. I've said this to you before, but I'll say it again. Every worship leader wants to be a preacher and every preacher wants to be a worship leader. And the reason I say that, I used to work with a guy named Bear Boyle. And Bear, lovely guy, loved Jesus, great worship leader. And he actually wrote his own songs. And one of the songs that he wrote was called Searched All Over. And the heart of the song, literally the entire song is searched all over, couldn't find nobody. Searched all over, couldn't find nobody like you. I wish, it's eight words. I wish I could write an eight word sermon and you guys wouldn't leave after two minutes if I just kept repeating those eight words. (laughs) This is why preachers want to be worship leaders. And so I remember that we would sing that song in church and like, at, like it kind of had a little bit of a 90s R&B feel to it. Like I expected there to be like an ooh yeah at the end of it. Like it just had this sense of like, this is what you might sing to a girl if you were trying to convince her that, that like she was your only one. <laughs> and he would be singing that in, in, in reference to his relationship with Jesus. But when I read this parable, it makes me think about this merchant searching all over and couldn't find another pearl that matched the beauty of what he found in the pearl that was representing the kingdom. So maybe let me say it this way. When you find the pearl of great price, you let go of lesser pearls. Let me just talk about some lesser pearls. Some of the lesser pearls that we chase is the the validation that comes through personal or professional accomplishment. That if I could just get somebody to tell me that I'm good because I accomplished this or accomplished that. Let me just confess to you that the script that plays over and over in my mind is that I'll be more loved and more valuable and more important and more worth something if I could achieve this or get to this or or, uh, uh, climb this ladder because somebody said to me that I didn't matter down here and I'm going to prove to them that I'm valid if I can get up here. And what you find is every accomplishment just leads you to long for another accomplishment that somehow those lesser pearls don't satisfy. Or or, or maybe uh, it's the pearl of belonging through relationship. All of us want to sit at the cool kids' table. 
All of us want to be associated with the right people and the right relationships and the right influence. And, and, and sometimes that plays out in, in us trying to cozy up to people that we wouldn't know, necessarily cozy up to. Other times that leads us down a path of making ourselves available in ways that we should not be available. At the heart of every broken sexual relationship outside of marriage is not just the, the physical joy and delight of having sex, but it's also this deep desire for, for belonging. And here's the reality that there's nobody in the world that can satisfy the deepest sense of belonging that you want, that lesser pearl doesn't match up. Or maybe it's the pearl of comfort but from material possessions. That if I could just get that car or those shoes, don't, don't, don't talk about shoes right now. <laughs> like, like, if I could just live in that neighborhood or go on that vacation, the world would be okay. And nothing catastrophic has to happen. You just have to have a transmission go out. You just have to pay for an oil change that is entirely too expensive. You just have to go on vacation with your kids to realize that this is not going to be restful at all. Like, like you, just, you, just, you just realize that this lesser pearl of chasing comfort doesn't actually bring what it promises. Or maybe it's the pearl of control over circumstances. If I could just make the world operate the way that it's supposed to, if I could just butt myself up and look the way that I'm supposed to and, and make, my, make everybody around me act the way that they're supposed to and I can get everything aligned and straightened out, if I could do all those things, if I could have control, I'm going to be okay. And the problem is that you don't have control and you're not okay. But holding on to those pearls... And investing who you are into those pearls seem to rob you of the agency that you need to go after the pearl of great price. That when that pearl of the kingdom is found, that all of a sudden, this is why Jesus would put so much emphasis on seeking. And you see seeking this, that he would say, seek first the kingdom of God. And all this other stuff is added to you. And that is not a ploy. If you get the kingdom, open up the bonus pocket and you get all this other stuff too. It's this understanding that the lesser pearls could never have satisfied it anyways. And in its truest form, the kingdom brings to bear the belonging, the worth, the comfort, and the, and the ability to navigate circumstances that you can't control. When the kingdom is revealed, the search is over. So what do we do with that? Jesus tells us that the kingdom of heaven has an inestimable value. Our only reasonable response is glad submission. I just want to leave you with two thoughts. Here's the first one. The proof of our desire is our pursuit. You've heard me say that before. But the proof of what you truly want can be measured by what you would go after. We're, we're amongst friends. Let's, 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 just, let's just confess things. There's a difference between saying you want to be healthy and paying for a gym membership at a gym that you never go to and actually changing the way that you live. The proof of your desire is your pursuit. There's a difference between I want to be the type of person that wakes up early, spends time with the Lord, makes sure that I've got my day lined out so that way I've got, um, I've, I've got what I need within me to love and care for the people around me and staying up all night watching Netflix. The proof of your desire is your pursuit. Y'all got quiet. Like, I, I, don't, I wasn't watching you last night. I don't know what you were doing. <laughs> and what Jesus would say is that the kingdom is worth giving everything up for. But the proof of our desire is our pursuit. Are you pursuing the things of the kingdom? 
Are you pursuing the things that the way that Jesus talks about it is that everything else will be destroyed by rust and moths, but the things of the kingdom that they will last forever. Is that where your energy is being put? Is that where your attention is being put? Is that where all of, is that where the, the way he talks about it is when this treasure is found, you sell everything so you can get that. The proof of the pearl merchant's desire and the proof of the field worker's desire was their willingness to sell all so that they could have the kingdom. Is that true of you? Here's the second thing. The proof of value is the price willingly paid. What, whatever something is value is, is what somebody's willing to pay for it. Um, back in 2016, I still lived in Dallas. I was part of a church planning residency and was praying about planting out here. And so um, I have, you guys have met him, Chris Brossett. He was a pastor out here. I knew him because of my residency. I was like, man, I should probably come out and spend some time with Chris begin to get to know the area a little bit better. I was like, since I'm going to be here, it would only be faithful for me to go to a Lakers game so I can fully understand the cultural context. <laughs> and so I'm talking with my wife, Sky about it. And she's like, no, I think you really should do that. Like, you should see if the, the church will help you do that. Like, in terms of um, the church that I was working at at the time would help you do that as part of your research. And yeah, if you want to go to a Lakers game, go to a Lakers game. So that was like November of 2015, early November. And so the schedule's out. I was like, I could do this in April. It's post-Easter. I have time. This would be awesome. And so late November, Kobe Bryant announced that he was retiring. And so the tickets that I, were look, that I was looking at for that game against Utah at the end of April, the nosebleed seats went from like $150 like $1,600. Now, before you judge me, I did not go to that game. <laughs> because the value of that ticket, I, I probably would have paid it if I could have afforded it. But like, I was like, I'm about to try and play at a church. Like, nah, I can't do that. That's not what I wanted to tell you. At that game, somebody brought in a Ziploc bag, grabbed that Ziploc bag, opened it and closed it and then got on eBay and said, this is air from Kobe Bryant's final game, $800. I don't know if somebody bought that, but if they did, I got some shoelaces that may have come from Magic Johnson a long time ago that I want to sell it. Right? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, like the fact that somebody would think this is that valuable, somebody's willing, going to be willing to pay this. Let me, let me put it, we, we, we talked about Netflix, let's talk about it again. Um, the the $15.99 that you pay over and over again, unless you're stealing it from your mama's account, like that $15.99 that you're paying for thousands of shows that you don't watch. But somehow when you think about your budget, it feels like that makes sense. We should, we should pay for that. The value of something to you can be measured by what you're willing to pay. I mean, maybe let me make it a little bit more spiritual for you in this moment, um, that the value of us to God could be measured by what he was willing to pay to redeem us, which was by the blood of Jesus. And so the value of something is always measured by what somebody would actually pay for it. Can, can I ask the question again about the kingdom? That the, the value of the kingdom, what would you expend to see the kingdom be made manifest and revealed in the world around you? What would you be willing to give up? What would you be willing to give away? What would you be willing to refrain from? What price would you pay to actually estimate the value of what the kingdom is for you? There, I love this story. There were two young men who because of what they heard about the slave trade were so broken and frustrated that they're like, we've got to get over there as missionaries. When they heard that um, the slave owners would not let anybody outside of those who were enslaved um, come anywhere near the grounds of who were there, their decision was, well, the call hasn't changed. The kingdom must be revealed. So these Monravian boys sold themselves into slavery. 
got on boats watching their family weep, not knowing if they were ever going to see their families again. And as they, they are getting out of earshot of their families, they would raise up their voices and they would yell, may the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. That in them, the kingdom was worth their freedom. The kingdom was worth the disruption of their life. In them, the kingdom was worth being put into a situation that they would be demeaned and thought less of and treated like they were not human. They were willing to do that because the value of seeing the kingdom revealed meant that much to them. It's the price that they would pay. And church, I want to be a people that we see the kingdom as being of an inestimable value. That there's nothing that the Lord can't ask of us that we wouldn't say, it's yours. That there's nothing of the kingdom that we wouldn't be willing to pay the price for because we believe so much that when God reveals that he transforms and he changes, that he, he brings light into darkness, that he redeems what's broken, that we believe that down in the very core of our beings that it flows out of us. So I just, as Jesus would put it, the kingdom is like a treasure. The kingdom is like a pearl of great price. Will you pursue it? And do you value it? Let's pray. So Jesus, I want to be like the two people in this story. I want to be like the two people that find so much joy and delight in your kingdom that all else can be, can be pushed off the table that I might find that. Lord, I pray for the exhausted believer in the middle of a mundane life who feels like I want the kingdom, but I don't feel like I've got the energy to pursue after it. Lord, would you, would you give us what we need to be faithful to what you're, where you're calling us? Would you give us the free time? And that might mean that we, we remove something else that we might have time for this. That might mean that we say no to this, that we might say yes to time with you. But would you give us the discernment, the wisdom, the courage to say no where we need to say no, that we might say yes to where we need to say yes? Lord, would you open our hands of lesser pearls? Would you open our hands of personal, of professional accomplishment? Would you open our hands with, of trying to be in the right relationship and seen with the right people? Would you open our hands of being the type of people who try and, and anesthetize our pain by getting more creature comforts? Would you break us of the illusion of control? And instead... Would you make us unsatisfied with anything less than the kingdom? And would we with gladness submit to what you have purchased for us in your blood? It's in your matchless name I pray. Amen. Thanks so much for checking out this message from Kings Harbor. We would love to connect with you. If you go to kingsharbor.org slash hello and fill out a short connect card, that allows us the opportunity to follow up with you. Also, if this message has been a blessing to your life, we believe that the Lord wants to rule and reign in every part of who we are. That means our time, our talent, our treasure. And so if, if this has been a blessing, we would ask that you would consider contributing back to the ministries of Kings Harbor so we can continue to bless and help people in the same way that we hope we have done for you. With that in mind, we want you to know that our heart towards you and our heart towards the world around us is that we want to be a love-forward people. And we're praying that you would join us in that.